Three years ago, you probably only heard skepticism of the COVID regime on this show. Maybe a handful of others, maybe from your crazy conservative uncle. Within the last year or so, you may have heard COVID skepticism from your center-right or maybe even center-left friends. Now you are hearing it during the opening monologue on Saturday Night Live. This country seems so divided, beautiful, ugly, black, white, blue, red. I love everybody. Maybe because I'm a redneck hippie. Uh, You know, the red in me thinks you should be allowed to own guns. The blue in me thinks squirt guns. (laughs) So I'm red and blue, which makes purple. So the movie goes like this. The biggest drug cartels in the world get together and buy up all the media and all the politicians and force all the people in the world to stay locked in their homes And people can only come out if they take the cartel's drugs and keep taking them over and over. I threw the script away. I mean, who is going to believe that crazy idea, (laughs) being forced to do drugs? I do that voluntarily all day long. Anyway. My favorite part of Woody Harrelson's bit, which is broadly this long drug joke, but within it, is this brutal joke about how COVID was just completely insane and bogus. My favorite part was the audience reaction. Because later on they laugh, but in that little COVID bit, they're almost totally silent. Liberal New Yorkers were trained for three years to take COVID super duper seriously. Now it's being presented to them as a joke. Some of us knew from the beginning that pretty much the whole thing was bogus, but they did not. And now we're finding out that the so-called conspiracy theorists were right all along. That fact is so obvious that they are now joking about it on Saturday Night Live. The ruling elite screwed up our lives over nothing. And in the audience's defense, it's tough to accept that something we believe to be so serious was in fact a joke. And the joke, of course, was on all of us. I'm Michael Knowles, this is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from the Darson, who says the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making women think their luggage never existed. You know, almost. I, w- I would say that was the greatest trick that a sort of minor demon pulled. Uh, so maybe who worked in the Biden administration, <laughs> but not not the devil himself. Just one of those sort of lesser, lesser demons, devils running around out there. When you want to stay alert, and I recommend you do, especially when you're going through the airport, then you got to check out Black Rifle Coffee. Right now, go to blackriflecoffee.com. Use promo code Knowles. Black Rifle Coffee is fueling Americans before they go out to do epic things with their lives. Led by a team of military veterans, the guys at Black Rifle Coffee are hyper-focused and hyper-vigilant in everything they do. Lucky for you, they're obsessed with making great coffee because every great adventure starts with a great cup of coffee. They serve great coffee to folks who love America, and that's the start and end of it. More than just making great coffee, Black Rifle Coffee's missionary goal is to give back to Americans who have fought and are fighting for freedom in this country. They want to sell enough premium coffee to be able to build a support network for veterans, first responders, and law enforcement. If you want to support this incredible company, go to blackriflecoffee.com. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at checkout for 10% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. The coffee is one of a kind. It's your support that gets gear, funding, and supplies into the hands of those on our front lines. Go to blackriflecoffee.com. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for 10% off. You can also find Black Rifle Coffee in grocery and convenience stores near you. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. I loved Woody Harrelson's bit. You see how he sets it up there. He's, He's giving himself runway with the audience, which is much more liberal than he is. But Woody Harrelson has cred on both sides of the aisle because, as he says, he's a redneck hippie. So he's kind of a right winger. He's kind of a left winger. Woody Harrelson is in many ways your average voter. That's why it matters that Woody Harrelson is making jokes about COVID now. It's like, this is insane. The drug companies, they have so much control over the media, so much control over the government. They get special legal protections. They lock us all up and say the only way you can leave your house is if you take our drug again and again and again. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? 
people like Woody Harrelson or Joe Rogan or Elon Musk or people who are, they're not right wingers exactly, but they're not leftist liberals. They're just, they represent, I think, the average voter. And so when the libs lose those guys, that is really, really dangerous for them in the elections. Why do people joke about this now? The reason that people are joking about COVID is because another government agency just concluded that a lot of what we were told about COVID was fake. The Energy Department, with its network of U.S. national laboratories, just revised its assessment to say, with low confidence, but nevertheless they're saying this, that the pandemic very likely began with a lab leak. Remember, the first story we told was was that the pandemic began with a bad batch of bat soup at a Wuhan wet market that just coincidentally was right down the street from a bio lab, but pay no attention to that. That's a crazy conspiracy theory. Already, we've got the National Intelligence Council and four agencies, four other agencies that the Wall Street Journal refuses to identify, uh, still believes with low confidence in the natural emergence theory, the Wuhan wet market theory. The FBI said two years ago now with moderate confidence that it probably began with the lab leak. The CIA and two other agencies still have not quite made a determination, but I think we see which way this is trending. Okay, that, that conspiracy theory that some people were talking about in 2020 Every single day that goes by seems to seem less fantastical and more and more correct because as, as many of us have noted before, the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth these days is about six to 12 months. Now, Apoorva Mandavili, who is a writer with the New York Times, she tweeted out in 2021, she said, someday we will stop talking about the lab leak theory and maybe even admit its racist roots but alas, that day is not yet here. That was two years ago. Two years later, the theory is almost entirely vindicated. All the authorities on this are leaning in that direction. New York Times looks ridiculous, as it always does. So we can say, good, we were right. We were right. Watching the Woody Harrelson monologue, we can say, oh, good, we were right. Watching the shift in public opinion, watching the way that people contracted the virus, watching the efficacy of the masks and the vaccines, all the studies that are coming out now showing that perhaps the vaccines were not quite so effective as we were told they were. In fact, a major study we talked about last week showing they weren't effective at all. The, the vaccine mandates citywide, not effective at all, according to a study that we also cited last week. So we can say we were right. It's not enough to be right. It is not enough to be right. Because you know what's going to happen to a poor Mandevilli at the New York Times who got the lab leak theory totally wrong, it would seem? Nothing's going to happen to her. Do you know what's going to happen to the companies that fired employees for not taking the Fauci ouchie, for the government bureaucrats fired people for not taking that Fauci ouchie, for the public officials who lied to us or at least were incompetent enough to, to get the whole pandemic wrong? But who also lied to us? You know what's going to happen to them? Probably nothing. It's not enough to be right. Because we're right now. We've been right in the past. We're always right. But they're just going to pull another trick in six months or a year. And we're going to be right again. And they're going to be wrong. And it's not going to matter because they're going to have the power. So what we have to do is hold people to account. Last year, during the midterm elections, I jokingly suggested something called the Michael Knowles Public Health Protection Pledge. And it said that I won't vote for anybody in a federal election who doesn't promise to, to zero out Dr. Fauci's salary and investigate him. And Rand Paul at that same time was going after Dr. Fauci pretty hard. Representative Paul Gosar actually entered in my public health protection pledge as a congressional resolution, started to pick up among some candidates. And once the polls started to look as though the Republicans were going to retake the House, what did Dr. Fauci say? said, peace, see you later, I'm out of here. I don't, I, because even beyond what I was saying on the podcast, even beyond what Rand Paul was saying on the floor of the Senate, it was pretty clear that the Republicans had this guy in their sights. And so Fauci said, okay, I want to leave. And he admitted he was leaving in part because he thought that would take some of the political pressure off. There are going to be a lot of Republicans who say, okay, Fauci's old news. The pandemic was three years ago. Let's just move on. Don't move on. You have to hold these people for, to account. If you don't drag Fauci before Congress, if you don't 
go after him for perjuring himself, which he certainly did, if you don't go after the other people who lied to us about COVID and screwed up everybody's lives for three years, they're just going to do it again. You, ha- you can't just say, let bygones be bygones. They're, they're already setting up the stage for the next big political power grab. Don't let them get away with this. You've got to teach them that there are consequences. Speaking of holding people to account, Wonderful story out of Florida yesterday, which is that they executed a murderer. Governor Ron DeSantis refused to pardon this guy. His name is Donald Dilbeck, career criminal, and he was executed. This is a guy who uh, was convicted of the 1990 murder of a woman, Faye Lam Van, a mother in a Tallahassee Mall parking lot. And he, uh, he was only able to murder her because he had escaped from prison where he was at the time serving a life sentence for killing a sheriff's deputy in 1979. This is a bad, bad dude. Now, this was the first execution in Florida in more than three years. It was the 100th execution since the Supreme Court allowed the practice to resume in 1975. And Ron DeSantis is going pretty hard after this. He's been, a, he's been a tough law and order kind of governor. And he's saying, well, if you kill somebody, we're going to kill you back. The final words of this man, Donald Dilbeck, are what really, to me, tell the whole story. So after the family of the woman that he murdered wrote, they said, 11,932 days ago, Donald Dilbeck brutally killed our mother. We were robbed of years of memories with her, and it has been very painful ever since. However, the execution has given us some closure. We're grateful to Governor DeSantis for carrying out the sentence. What were the final words of this murderer? He said, I know I hurt people when I was young. I really messed up, but I know Ron DeSantis has done a lot worse. He's done a lot worse than murder two people, one of whom was a mother. Uh, He's taken a lot from a lot of people. I speak for all men, women, and children. He's put his foot on our necks. Ron DeSantis and other people like him can suck our, then he names an appendage, which I won't, I won't name. Those are his final words. Ron DeSantis can suck my appendage. And (laughs) my conclusion from that is, this guy didn't learn anything. This murderer, this double murderer, guy who kills a, a mother in cold blood in a parking lot, 32 and a half years he was in prison. He didn't learn anything. One of the arguments against the death penalty is we need to give these guys time to change their mind, to repent, to rehabilitate. First of all, hanging concentrates the mind. I sometimes think a shorter time scale to consider repentance is better than a longer one. But even look at the long one. 32 and a half years wasn't enough to change this guy's mind. Those are the final words he wants to go out on. Doesn't learn a damn thing in prison. Doesn't seem to have any remorse whatsoever. See you, buddy. The civil authority does not wield the sword in vain, and people need to know, the public needs to know that there are consequences to bad actions. This is basic incentives. If you don't punish bad behavior, you're going to get more bad behavior. If if you don't reward good behavior, then you're less likely to get more of that good behavior. Basic incentives, and some of those basic government incentives include the noose, or in this case, the lethal injection. You too will die someday. That's why you need to check out Epic Will. Right now, go to epicwill.com, use promo code Knowles. According to a recent poll, 62% of Americans who think about their own death a lot of the time do not have a will. Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? It's a little like being afraid your house will burn down, but not having homeowner's insurance, or being afraid of drowning, but refusing to wear a life jacket. A will protects your wishes and your family should something happen to you. When you have one, you have peace of mind because you know you've done your best to protect the ones you care about. I cannot stress enough how important it is to write a will, and Epic Will is here to get you started. For just $119 and in as little as five minutes, Epic Will can help you create your last will and testament, living will, and even healthcare power of attorney. Their step-by-step online form makes it super easy. All you've got to do is fill in the blanks. Do it now. I put off getting my will for so long, And I wouldn't have known what would happen to my money or my stuff, or most importantly, my kids. So now it's squared away. Go to epicwill.com. Be like me. Use promo code Knowles to save 10% on Epic Will's complete will package. That's epicwill.com, promo code Knowles. Forget for a moment Ron DeSantis, who's done a great job on crime and law and order down in Florida. Let's turn it up a notch a little bit. Let's take a look down at El Salvador. 
El Salvador, not known for being the safest place in the world, probably not where you want to go honeymoon. And yet, El Salvador has had, it's a miracle political program over the last couple of years. El Salvador's murder rate has plummeted by 50%. El Salvador, with a new, a new president, President Naib Bukili, has had its, its murder rate tumble 56.8% in 2022 alone. How did El Salvador do that? It wanted to do that. It, it wanted to fix the murder problem. It mustered the political will to do it. And then the president, effecting this policy, sent in troops to go round up MS-13 like the animals that they are. They just released a propaganda video. It's an amazing propaganda video. So you see the MS-13 gangsters in this prison, this supermax prison. You've got these MS-13 gangsters. They've got their heads down. They're all crouched over. They look like insects. So they're all tatted up in green. They've got their heads down below their hands. The guards all have black masks on, presumably because the guards don't want MS-13 to go murder all their families. They're, they're just standing in their boxer shorts. The reason, by the way, that they're shirtless, I think, is to show that they're all just tatted up in all this green, some, sometimes occult imagery. If demons were incarnate, it would be these guys. And yet, when they're outside the clink, they look so tough right? That people are encouraged to join these, these types of gangs because they think it'll, it'll get them money and women and status. And yet what the president has done here is cram them all into this extremely high security prison, round them up like animals. I think he, he rounded up something like 65,000 of these criminals, threw them all in prison. And then he didn't just stop there. He created a very slick, highly produced propaganda video humiliating them. And then he put that out there for all the world to see. We need, we need to learn from El Salvador. Never thought I would say that sentence, but we in the United States need to follow the lead of the government of El Salvador. We need to be clear that if you commit crimes, you will be punished for it. There's really basic stuff that we all used to know. One of the arguments against capital punishment is that it doesn't actually deter crime. And the studies that suggest it doesn't actually deter crime are a little bit suspect, but let's take them at face value. Let's say it's true that capital punishment today does not really deter crime. What would the surprise be there? We don't really carry out capital punishment. The way it's carried out is completely haphazard. Most of the time, some lib governor will just let everybody off the hook, or some court will pretend like capital punishment is cruel and unusual punishment. It's neither. And so even if there is a a conviction for capital punishment. It's not going to deter crime because people don't believe that it, they're actually going to carry it out. If you had a country right now where the president attended a capital punishment, let's say there were capital punishment at the federal level, a federal inmate is going to be executed, and the president not only didn't grant clemency, but showed up as the face of justice in America, that would do a lot to deter crime. And what the libs and the squishes would say is they would say, this is, this is cruel. This is inhumane. This is authoritarian. It's authoritarian. That's what they are saying, in fact. The New Yorker says, the rise of Naib Bukili's El, of El Salvador's authoritarian president. Oh, he's so, it's a repressive crackdown. Listen to what they say. They say, the budding strongman has ridden Bitcoin schemes and a repressive crackdown on gangs to become Latin America's most popular leader. Can you be repressive against gangs? I guess, I guess so. I guess you can repress the gangs, but that seems like that is actually liberative of the people. It's not repressive on the people. When you, when you go after these criminals, when you go after these gangsters, it represses that group and it frees the other group. That's why he's Latin America's most popular leader. It's authoritarian. He's wielding authority to do good, <laughs> to get the bad guys and to help the good guys. We should be doing that too. I mentioned on the show 
a week or two ago, I said, there are two words, you got to write them down. If you're driving, wait until you pull over. I don't want you to get in a car accident. The two, the two phrases you've got to write down are big government and authoritarian. Those are words that today don't mean anything. Authoritarian is just a word that the liberals use when conservatives wield political power ever. We should be doing that. We should do that a lot more. We should take some real lessons from Naib Bukili. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. What he is showing us is that the law is a teacher. We've known this all the way back to the ancient Greeks. The law is a teacher. So we on the American right, we like to say politics is downstream of culture. And that is true to a certain extent. The movies affect the government and the way, the way that law is made. No question about it. I think Daily Wire has actually shown that pretty clearly in the battle over transgenderism, among other battles. But the law also affects politics, and the law is also a teacher. And when the law sends an army to your door and rounds up your gang like the animals that they are, you're going to get fewer gangsters, and they're co- going to commit fewer crimes. And that's going to change the culture, and that's a good thing. Speaking of the law as a teacher... Great new law in Kansas. Kansas has become the first state to pass a bill that defines woman as someone who is biologically born female. That's it. That's what a woman is, which means that this will ban men who identify as transgender women from using single sex areas designated for women. It's called the Women's Bill of Rights. It was approved by legislators 26 to 10 on Thursday. Only Republican support there. And the bill defines a female as someone, quote, whose biological reproductive system is developed to to produce ova, while male (laughs) refers to anyone whose reproductive system, quote, is developed to fertilize the ova of a female. This is a beautiful bill because it, it doesn't just say, don't trans the kids. It doesn't just say, wait till eight to introduce kids to transgenderism in schools. Once they turn nine, that's fine doesn't just say only minors can't. It's, it bans transgenderism for all practical purposes in the state, for everybody. And it has to. In order for women to have the right to have their own bathrooms, you have to ban transgenderism entirely. You can't just ban it for the kids. It's got to be entirely. In order for women to be able to have their own locker rooms at the gym, you have to ban transgenderism entirely in order to protect businesses from having to participate in weird occult sexual rituals like the transgender transition. You have to ban transgenderism entirely. I love this bill because it is so much more aggressive than the other bills we've seen. The other, I don't mean to knock the other governors and the other state houses. They've done a great job laying the groundwork, the groundwork rather. But this bill goes much further and it reminds us of a truth in politics that Republicans all too often forget. You're either on offense or you're on defense. You're either making gains in the culture or you're losing ground in the culture. There's no standing still. There's no status quo. There's no neutrality. And what the conservatives have screwed up on for at least 50 years now, probably more, is the libs make some crazy aggressive play and then we try to dial it back by about 5 to 10 percent. Or worse, we try to slow it down by about 5 to 10%. So, so the libs attack the family through feminism, the fundamental political institution. They claim that men and women are basically the same. That takes the culture pretty far to the left. And then conservatives try to, they try to inch it back a little bit. But not by, the, by the time they're even thinking about inching it back, the libs push forward with the normalization of other sexual practices, gay rights, among other things. And then, oh, by the time the conservatives are trying to dial that back, the libs, have, they've lurched much further to the left. They're trying to redefine marriage now. They say, redefine marriage? Well, I don't know. I guess we could come to some kind of terms with a civil union. And by the time you say that, whoop, they've lurched even further to the left. Now they're saying, actually, we've got transgenderism. Actually, now a man can become a woman. A man can become a woman. Okay, but, but maybe we shouldn't do it to my, by the time we say that, whoop, oh my gosh, we're now, we're all the way off the screen. Because now they're trying to trans the kids. And there are many conservatives now who are saying, look, if, you want, if you're a man and you want to put on a dress, that's fine. But just don't do it to children. Just don't make me pay for it. No. The, the only way, even to stop there, even if all you want to do is stop where we are right now, the only way to do that is to push so aggressively in the other direction that you're trying to take back ground that we ceded 
years ago, decades ago. Kansas absolutely leading the way. Love it. We got to hire some of those people. We need to hire those Kansas politicians for the National Republican Party. When you want to hire people, you got to check out ZipRecruiter. Right now, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. Really, really important to get good people for your company, okay? Personnel is policy. It's the most important investment you are going to make in your company. ZipRecruiter's matching technology excels at finding the most qualified candidates for a wide range of roles. If you're hiring, you can quickly find the right person. Head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. Try it for free. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find the right candidates for your job. You see a candidate you like, you can easily send them a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. Their user-friendly dashboard makes it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates all from one place. Let ZipRecruiter help you find the best people for all your roles. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself at ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles to try for free. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Do not hesitate. One more second. Get the very best people for your role. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. The only way that we are going to score cultural wins and take back cultural ground is to punish the people who have, who have upended our culture so. It's, I think, the broad theme of today's show. Punishment. I'm the punisher. Michael, the Punisher Knowles over here, looking to Ron DeSantis and the president of El Salvador and the state house in Kansas to lead the way forward for the nation. Looking also to Chloe Cole. Chloe Cole is a detransitioned 18-year-old woman. She has just announced the first official lawsuit in the United States against the hospital and affiliated medical group that facilitated her medical transition as a minor. Absolutely great news. We saw a story similar to this about a couple of weeks ago in Canada. The first transgender detransition person sued her doctors in Canada for transitioning her. I thought it was great at the time. I said, we need this in the United States. Now we're seeing it. The Center for American Liberty, along with the Dillon Law Group, you know, our friend Harmeet Dillon and uh, Lamandry and Jonah LLP have filed a lawsuit against the Permanente Medical Group the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, alleging medical negligence. That's the charge here. A kid goes up, says, hey, I know I'm a girl, but I say that I'm a boy now, and therefore I want you to pump me full of chemicals and mutilate me. Doctors, if they are following the Hippocratic Oath and acting in a way that is medically responsible, will say, oh, no, you're not. (laughs) No, you're not. Let's get you some Doctors who are negligent and perverse and incompetent or worse, they will say, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, you're a man. And coincidentally, we're going to recommend surgeries and drugs that are very, very expensive and that you're going to be hooked on for the rest of your life. Okay, get her over to the operating table. That's, that's medical negligence. I know that some conservatives are going to say, well, it's the, it's the individual's fault for, for demanding this. Or in the case of minors, well, it's the parent's fault for taking the the children to these hospitals. Though increasingly, the parents don't have much say over it. The state is coming in and enforcing these kinds of procedures. But it's the doctor's fault too. The doctor should not be performing these surgeries and they should be held to account. They should lose their licenses and they should lose a lot of money. As Harmeet put it, Chloe's family sought medical treatment for her at Kaiser. Her physicians and other medical professionals violated the first norm of the profession, the Hippocratic Oath, when instead of caring for her and providing medically competent diagnoses and treatment, they permanently disfigured her for profit, for a pretty high profit. Because with a it's not cheap, but it's not that expensive. Or telling a, a young person to maybe go you know, maybe try to sort things out. Uh, these are probably as well. as They don't make any money on that. But, but sending someone to get some of the most expensive treatments on earth for the rest of their lives, that does make a profit. And I think it's a great angle to focus on. And I think every other detransitioner who has experienced even the slightest pang of regret should sue these people into the dirt. Speaking of holding bad actors to account... Joe Biden is facing a lot of criticism because the president refuses to go to East Palestine, Ohio. He was finally asked about this on ABC News, and 
the president said, not only is he not going to go to East Palestine, he doesn't even really remember who he's talked to over there. It's been three weeks now since the toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, as you know. The mayor says he saw you in Ukraine, and he says it tells you he doesn't care about us. And they're asking, is the president coming to Ohio? Do you have any plan to travel to Ohio, and have you talked with the mayor yet? Let's put this in perspective. Within two hours of that derailment, the EPA was in there. Within two hours. Every major agency in the United States government that had anything to do with rail and or cleanup was there and is there. So do you plan to travel there and have you talked with the mayor? I, I, I can't recall where that. I don't think I've talked to the mayor. I've talked to everyone else there and I'm multiple times. I've talked to both the senators, both, uh, both governors. I've talked to, uh, to everyone there is to talk to. And we've made it clear that everything is available. Yeah, but are you going to go? Why won't you answer that question? <laughs> Credit to David Muir here. He's, he asks, are you going to go to East Palestine? But says, well, now listen here. Come on now, Jack. Come on. You're going to go get some mint chocolate chip, take a swim down by the pool. 23 skidoo, Jack. He says, okay. Um, but are you going to go to East Palestine? Uh, l- listen here, fat. I, w- I, w- I was talking to senators and I, come on, and, and, and I said, I, I, I said back when I was in the swimming pool, back in Scranton, I, Mr. President, hello, Mr. President, you going to answer? You're not going to answer because the, the answer is no. He is not going to go to East Palestine as of today. And do you know why he can't go? It's not just that he's lazy. It's not just that he doesn't like the people in Ohio. It's not just that he thinks they're deplorable, irredeemable flyover people. He can't go because Trump went. He can't go because if he goes, he's going to look so weak. He's going to look like Trump bullied him into going. He can't go because he knows the people in East Palestine like Trump. They don't like Biden. The people in East Palestine are Republicans by and large, not Democrats. And even beyond partisanship, the people of East Palestine rightly observe that the the current president, Joe Biden, doesn't give a damn about them. And Trump actually does seem to care. You can see it. It was the first moment of Trump's campaign where I thought, man, he might be getting his mojo back. This is what I want to see from Trump. Trump campaigns on going to East Palestine, eating McDonald's with people, making fun of Joe Biden, forcing Joe Biden to to at least address the issue, saying, where are you, Joe? Why won't you come down? That's the guy. That's the guy that you're going to want to vote for. Another example. I know people always doubt Trump's political strategy. I've thought that Trump is a pretty good political strategist. My evidence for this is the man won the highest office in the land the first time he ever officially ran for it. He kind of teased a campaign in 2000, but the first time he really ran, uh, he he didn't win mayor, he didn't win congressman, he didn't win senator. He won the highest office in the land. The guy probably knows a thing or two about politics. And the strategy here was really, really smart. Or at least even if it wasn't conscious, the effect of it is really, really smart. Right now, Biden is in a lose-lose. He's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. If he goes to East Palestine, he looks like a jerk. If he doesn't go to East Palestine, he looks like a jerk. And the reason for that is he is a jerk. (laughs) So it's a a good strategy because it shows us the truth. Now, what is the federal government doing with regard to East Palestine? The federal government finally has ordered a halt to the cleanup because you you know how this administration works. The, The administration allows problems to fester, not just on transportation, but on crime, on immigration, on international affairs, on everything. They just allow problems to fester and they get really, really bad. And then you get some catastrophic event like you saw with the train derailment in Ohio. And then even if you don't want to blame the administration and say it's entirely their fault for how the train derailed, okay, that's fine. It's not entirely their fault. But then what happens? The cleanup starts to create even more problems. There were questions raised about why did, why did Norfolk Southern have to burn off all of those toxic chemicals and send a mushroom cloud of poison into the air? Well, they said, because one of the cars might have exploded. There was a problem with one of the cars. Okay, well, why did you burn off the chemicals in five cars? Well, you know, there was a problem in a second car. Okay, but were there, there weren't problems in all of these cars. And so in some cases, couldn't you have contained the chemicals? Did you have to burn all of them off? polluting the air, giving the residents of East Palestine all sorts of terrible rashes and coughs and and ailments, apparently compromising the drinking water. It remains 
unclear how compromised that drinking water is, but a lot of the water intake facilities nearby are turning off East Palestine. They say, no, we don't want any water that's anywhere near East Palestine. They don't trust the water there. And now what about all the poison dirt? What about all of the debris from this derailment? Where's it going? Well, apparently it's been going all over the place. Officials in in Texas and Michigan have said that they are now receiving the debris from the derailment and they're getting tainted soil and they're getting tainted water. Millions of gallons of water used to douse fires at that site have been brought into their states without full disclosure. So they, they, they wake up one day in Texas and Michigan. They say, wait, why are you sending your poison over here, federal government? How is it that you can take a bad situation and just make it worse by the day? and have no accountability for it at all. Ohio officials say that 20 truckloads of contaminated soil have been hauled away from the site. Some 15 truckloads were taken to a licensed hazardous waste facility in Belleville, Michigan. Five were then sent back to East Palestine. What is this all about? Why is this so incompetent? And why was it all burned off? I I don't want to sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist, but given, given how conspiracy theories have been basically almost all of them vindicated in the last three years. I guess we have to entertain them. I told you, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I am a coincidence noticer. I have to ask, is is maybe one of the potential explanations for the massive burn-off of chemicals that many experts have said was imprudent and unnecessary, is maybe one of the explanations for uh, Norfolk Southern just secretly hauling off without full disclosure the, the waste to these other places? Or they may be covering something up. Is there something here that we haven't quite seen? So I'm I'm glad to see the EPA finally has come down and said, hey, we're going to halt this. We're going to halt this cleanup until we can figure out what the hell is going on. Wish that they would have figured that one out three weeks ago. It just seems like this administration is always a day late and a dollar short. It's your last chance to celebrate President's Day this year. Take advantage before it's too late with the Daily Wire's Our President's for Sale sale with 40% off memberships. The big guy got 10%. We're giving you 40%. Get access to the world of Daily Wire Plus with fearless documentaries, gripping movies, Dennis Prager's master's program, and the entire library of Dr. Jordan Peterson's work, including new productions, Exodus, Logos and Literacy, On Marriage, all available to watch right now. Coming down the pipeline to a TV or a laptop near you. New episodes of Ben Shapiro's The Search, Exodus Part 2, our much anticipated DW Kids content, and Pendragon later this year. We're also giving you up to 40% off select items in the Daily Wire shop. Last chance to take advantage of our presidents for sale. Sale today. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe to become a member today. Dailywire.com slash subscribe. Speaking of Joe Biden covering things up, Joe Biden's got another scandal on his hands, which is that shortly after haranguing Donald Trump, for allegedly holding classified documents improperly at his home, Joe Biden was discovered to be improperly holding classified documents at his home, at one of his offices, documents dating back not just to his presidency, when he would have had the authority to declassify the documents, but to his vice presidency, potentially to his Senate days. Guy's got classified documents everywhere, apparently left some of them in a box next to his Corvette that his degenerate son was driving. Oh, that's good. Hunter Biden, who makes pretty much all of his money on corruption, and specifically corruption, selling his father's influence to foreign actors in Ukraine and in China when when Joe Biden was vice president. Yeah, that guy just was just tooling around in the vet right next to all those classified documents. So Joe Biden was just asked about this, also by David Muir on ABC News. He was asked, what's the difference between what Trump did and what you did? Here's the answer. But I do remember something you said after the discovery at Mar-a-Lago. You said, I thought data that was in there may compromise sources and methods and names of people who help, and it's just totally irresponsible. Can you assure the American people that none of the documents discovered in your garage or at your old office compromised sources or methods or U.S. intelligence? I've been advised by the council, let the Justice Department make that decision. They also saw you, though, comment on former President Trump. And, and so at the very least... Because, look, here's what they were showing. They were, you guys were showing on television things lying on the ground and said top secret, national, you know, uh, code word. 
And the difference is every single solitary thing I've been asked to do, I've done voluntarily. You're trying to make a, a comparison. What, there's degrees of responsibility that are, they can be significant degrees of responsibility. So his defense is, look, there's different degrees of responsibility, and that's true. But the different degrees all favor Trump. Trump had the right to declassify any documents he wanted. He didn't have to follow any particular procedure to do it. He could have done it in his head. The president of the United States is not responsible to any bureaucrat when it comes to declassifying documents. Joe Biden, when he took those documents, did not have any such right. So the different degrees of responsibility here is Joe Biden had a far greater responsibility to handle these documents with care, and he violated that responsibility in a far more egregious way. And he knows it. That's why even Joe Biden, who doesn't remember what end is up, was, was impelled to answer at the top of that question. He said, uh, I've been advised by the council not to say anything because I, they, obviously they've got me dead to rights. I doubt anything is going to happen as a result of it. I doubt he's going to be held to account. I'm sure we're going to see more of this corruption from the Democrats because when you don't punish bad behavior, <laughs> then you're going to get more of it. But he's at least admitting, at least implicitly, that what he did was a lot worse. Speaking of leaders, there is a kid. He went a little bit viral over the weekend. I want to make him go much more viral. I am so impressed with this kid. He was a freshman at a liberal high school. And I'm sure that his school is a lot like your school. I'm sure that his school is a lot like schools all around the country. Liberal, uh, uh, racist, sexist, and in all the opposite ways that, that we're told that the public institutions are. And he said enough. And he showed up to his school board and he gave an oratory worthy of at least getting him elected to Congress, if not president already at the age of 14. Take a listen. Hi, my name is Brad Taylor and I just finished my freshman year at RHS. Um, I've been a part of District 196 schools now for 10 years. And I'm going to give you a glimpse today of what's actually going on inside these schools. Um, despite the board's attempt to deny it, District 196 schools are quickly becoming a place where promoting activism is actually more important than promoting education. I'll take, you, I'll take you back to my first day at RHS this fall. The principal came out and gave us a heartfelt speech about equality and standing together. Um, he began to list countless races, such as Latino, Asian, expressing how much they matter and how important they are. But never once did he mention a race or identity that reflects me or half the kids that were in the class. My honors government teacher, I'm not going to say his name, but he's mentioned that Democrats care more about all people while Republicans only care about themselves. And he's also inferred to us that socialism is better than democracy. He even had a statue. He had a statue of a socialist leader in his classroom. I've been approached by multiple teachers who have told me in private that they just want to say that they agree with me and they support me standing up, but they can't say it in front of the class for fear of being disciplined by the administration in some way or losing their jobs. Now, due to all these instances I've mentioned and many more that I can't fit in this five-minute speech, I've decided to leave this district and continue school on a private Christian school online. But I will never stop believing that everybody has value, no matter their skin color or personal beliefs. And it's a shame that you're not going to be able to say that I was an alumni of RHS in District 196. Thank you. Preach. <laughs> Preach, man. man. What can this kid run for? I, I, what is he, 15? He just finished his freshman year in high school. I guess it's a little too young for Congress, but let me know when you're ready to run, kid. I can't wait to donate. I can't wait to go vote. Beautiful. That, that kid showing more clarity and maturity and courage than any, and not only any other student at the school, any teacher at the school. He's saying these, the teachers come up to me, they say, you're right, I agree with you, but I don't want to lose my job. How sad is that? You're going to say, hey, you, 15-year-old, thanks for doing what I, a grown adult, am unwilling to do. Love it. And it presents a political opportunity for Republicans. We have control of a lot of states around the country right now. This is a great opportunity to push school choice. And why should we push school choice? Because the Democrats rely on the schools as a major power center. School choice is the easiest way to weaken their grip on that power. And it's a very powerful power center because classrooms are crystal balls that show you what your country is going to look like in 20 years. Shapes the very malleable minds of little kids. 
School choice is the biggest threat to that. I've been mentioning it in my new state of Tennessee, which I love so much. This would be a great opportunity. The governor campaigned on school choice. He's obviously very supportive of it. We've got, I don't know, like three Democrats in the whole legislature. The, the Republicans outnumber the Democrats three to one, four to one in the House and the Senate. Let's get it done, guys. This is a great opportunity. You have to be on the offense or you will be on the defense. It's, it's like a business. Anyone who's ever run a business or worked for a business for that matter will know that a business is either growing or dying. Businesses don't just stay the same, though. It doesn't work that way. You've got to be growing or dying. You've got to be moving forward or you're going to be pushed backward. So let's do it. While we've got power, let's just put that pedal to the metal and let's give more kids the opportunity that this young man has to go pursue more edifying educational opportunities. And perhaps even more important, weaken the stranglehold of these crazy libs that they have on public education so that we can create better schools in the future, so that we can go back, get a little more power in public education and turn it toward the good, the true, and the beautiful, not the ugly, the false, and the wicked as it is now. Speaking of young people, really disturbing story from Paris Hilton. I haven't thought about Paris Hilton in a long time. It's been, Paris Hilton... I guess she was sort of eclipsed by Kim Kardashian, and Kim Kardashian continues to have a bad effect on her and on the culture because Kim Kardashian apparently encouraged Paris Hilton to engage in IVF. And IVF is a controversial issue even among pro-lifers because many people who oppose abortion, who are pro-life, they will still be in favor of IVF. And one of the reasons for this is that there are many people out there who would not have their children without IVF. And so they say, well, if this process gave me my child, whom I love so, then it has to be a good process. And no one is doubting that your child is great and that you having a child is a great thing. But good ends do not justify immoral means. We're not Machiavellians here. We're not utilitarians here. We're not consequentialists here. We're conservatives. We believe that, that the morality of actions depends upon the action itself. And in this case, the way that Paris Hilton has done it really shows you how morally problematic IVF is because Paris Hilton now has 20 children. I don't think she has any children that have been born, but she has 20 frozen embryos. Why does she have 20? Why has she so irresponsibly created 20 unique human beings and then just shoved them all in a freezer? Well, because she keeps getting boys and she doesn't want boys. She wants girls. So she's just going to keep trying IVF. She's got unlimited money. So she's just going to engage in IVF until she gets a girl. And the doctors, I think, are more than happy to do it. It's a very expensive process. Doctors are more than happy to trans the kids. It's a very expensive process. The doctors are more than happy to engage in IVF. It'll make them a lot of money. So who knows? Maybe Paris will get 25 of her sons frozen forever, or 30, or 35, until she gets a girl. She says, She's waiting for that girl. Now, obviously, if it were reversed and you saw someone say, yeah, I'm putting all the girls in a freezer until I get a boy. I really want a boy. You'd have the feminists screaming and crying and say this is sexist and terrible and eugenics. But but because it's a boy and boys are are castigated by the culture, they they don't want to say that. Because boys are toxic. You know, masculinity is evil and toxic. We have to get rid of it. That is really evil stuff. And why is she doing IVF in the first place? She says, oh, I'm just so scared. I think, again, leading back to Provo of being in a doctor's office, all of that, the shots, the IVs that they put in. She says she was, she was uh, traumatized when she was in a room when a woman was giving birth, when she was doing her reality TV show, The Simple Life. So it's not even that she's saying she doesn't want to give birth or try the natural way uh, because of some medical condition or because of some personal trauma. It's just because it seems kind of icky to her. She doesn't want to have to do it. So she's going to have it done in test tubes, and then she'll rent out the womb of some poor woman and inject it into her. And then uh, maybe then that woman will give birth to her child. Uh, But maybe she won't at all. If she just keeps getting boys, she'll probably just leave them in the freezer forever. Can anyone explain to me why this should not be illegal? Can anyone see I know that many people are tempted to support IVF, especially if it's benefited you personally or a family member. Does anybody seriously believe that this is okay, that this is morally right, that this is morally acceptable at all? Putting souls on ice, real human beings, and for your own children? 
because you don't like boys. Imagine if one of these boys is born and finds out, wait, my mom put me in a freezer and created 20 of my siblings because she doesn't like boys that much. What's that going to do to people's minds? Could you imagine that? You're one of Paris Hilton's sons. You see this. You read about this. Tell me that, that this should not be illegal. Tell me that it would be authoritarian or terrible or too, too much a use of big government to say, hey, you're not allowed to make a bunch of kids and then throw them in a freezer forever. No one, I don't think anyone can really do that. It's Music Monday, baby. We got to get on over to the member block. Uh, ben Davies has given me a song that he, he wants me to throw all of my pop culture prowess onto, and I'm willing to do that. We will see you there. If you're not a member, why not? Are you just one of those hoi polloi out there perusing this show on YouTube for free? You got to go to dailywire.com slash Knowles, get into W-L-E-S. Use code Knowles at checkout to get two months free on all annual plans.